Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Daniel, S. Schneider, Jillian, Mark, Tori, Joe, and Trigger. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. And because you supported us in the month of May, you and everyone else who becomes a subscriber through Patreon or drops us a one-time tip, no subscription required, through buymeacoffee.com, will be entered into a raffle at the end of the month, the prize for which is our first giveaway of exclusive merchandise. If you'd like to learn more about that and find out about the perks available to subscribers, you'll find links to both Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description. And I'd like to give a great big thank you and good luck to everyone who supports us. Without your help, this podcast does not exist, and I'm sincerely grateful to you. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in... Let it out slowly, and off we go. This evening, let's return to a work of science from which we haven't read in some time, A Molecular and Microscopic Science, by Mary Somerville, author of The Mechanism of the Heavens, Physical Geography, Connection of the Physical Sciences, etc., Volume 1 of Two Volumes, with illustrations. First published in 1869 by John Murray, Abermarle Street, London. Let's pick up right where we left off in Section 1, Elementary Constitution of Matter. Let's begin. The new arrangements among atoms of the same kind show that the immutability of matter is not without exceptions. The animal kingdom is the great reservoir of phosphorus, a simple substance that is never found uncombined. It is sparingly met with in the vegetable kingdom, and still less in the mineral but may be procured abundantly from calcined bones. When pure, it is colorless, transparent, solid, extremely poisonous, and so inflammable that it must be kept in water. In air, it is in continual combustion with oxygen, during which ozone is produced. When burnt in a current of air, Phosphorus leaves a residuum consisting of two substances, of which one is an acid, the other is red allotropic phosphorus, which has been extensively used in the manufacture of lucifer matches, because its fumes are not deleterious, and because it inflames less easily than common phosphorus, to which it is reduced by heat or friction, which generates heat. Silicon is a simple substance never found alone, but when 48 parts of it are combined with 52 parts of oxygen gas, it forms rock crystal, the purest form of silica, or quartz. Silica is so abundant that it may be said to constitute the basis of the mineral world. The sand on the seashore which is the debris of quartz rocks, shows how universally it prevails. 
It is even abundant in the vegetable kingdom, giving strength to the stalks and leaves of the grasses, and may be felt in the harshness of the beards of wheat and barley. Silicon exists in three different states. The amorphous, which has no form. The graphic, which takes the form of small hexagonal plates and that of octahedral silicon. Hence, this substance is dimorphous. A singular analogy obtains between silicon and carbon. The amorphous form of silicon corresponds to charcoal. The graphic form of silicon corresponds to the graphic form of carbon, and the octahedral form of silicon to the diamond. Yet the chemical relations between the two substances are very small. Silica has hitherto been considered to be insoluble in pure water. At least Monsieur Bischoff states that only one part of silica dissolves in 769,230 parts of water. But by a method hereafter to be explained, Professor Graham has actually obtained a limpid solution of silica in pure water. Boron is a constituent of boracic acid, a natural production in Tibet and Monte Corbalo in Tuscany. It is a greenish-brown solid, insoluble in water, but when heated to about 600 degrees, it burns in open air with a vivid flame. Fluorine is a constituent of a very beautiful mineral, well known as fluor spar, which is found in cubic crystals of green, yellow, or purple color. Hydrofluoric acid, obtained chemically from the mineral, is highly volatile and extremely corrosive. Three of the non-metallic simple substances, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, are connected by the most remarkable analogies. They are marine productions, for chlorine is obtained from common sea salt and in greater purity from rock salt, both of which are compounds of chlorine and the metal sodium. When seawater is evaporated, salt and a substance called bittern remain, which contains a salt whence bromine is separated. Again, when kelp, the ashes of burnt seaweeds, is purified from the carbonate of soda and the chloride of potassium, a salt is left which is the iodide of potassium, whence iodine is obtained. Iodine is also found in sponges, oysters, and other low sea animals, as well as in certain mineral springs, and sometimes in combination with silver. These three elemental bodies have little affinity for one another, but they combine powerfully with other substances. Chlorine is a yellowish-green gas, twice as heavy as atmospheric air, with a noxious, suffocating smell and a stringent taste. It has a powerful bleaching property, and when combined with water, which absorbs twice its volume of the gas, it is used for bleaching linen, in calico printing, and other arts. The clear solution of chloride of lime is still more in use for the same purpose, as well as for an antidote against contagion and unwholesome smells. Carbon does not burn in chlorine gas, yet it is capable of supporting combustion. For oil of turpentine, phosphorus, thin leaves of tin and copper, and powdered antimony, take fire spontaneously in it. This gas shows its power by the development of intense heat, but not by brilliant light, 
because the results of its combustion are mostly vapors, or such gases as have a feeble illuminating power. So chlorine differs materially from oxygen in the phenomena of combustion. Mr. Faraday observes, however, that the bleaching powder is analogous to ozone in being an intermediate state, for chlorine is pernicious and violently destructive as a gas, perfectly innocuous and quiescent in common salt and in its other natural combinations, while in the bleaching substances its energy is subdued by art so as to make it an important agent in various manufactures. Providentially, chlorine is never found free, but in a combined state, it exists in enormous quantities in the salt of the ocean, in salt lakes, brine springs, and in extensive deposits of rock salt, as well as in organic liquids. It has a strong affinity for hydrogen and forms muriatic acid. A mixture of these two gases remains inactive in the dark, but explodes in sunshine. By chemical means, chlorine is made to combine with oxygen so as to produce four substances, two of which are gases of such unstable equilibrium and weak affinity that the slightest cause makes them detonate violently. The other two are more stable, though they contain a greater quantity of oxygen. The only combination of chlorine with nitrogen is the most powerful and dangerous explosive compound known. Chlorine combines naturally with sulfur and with the metals so as to form ores. Common salt affords a remarkable instance of change of volume by chemical combination. Twenty-four parts in bulk of salt contain 20.7 parts of sodium and 23.3 parts of liquid chlorine. Hence, by chemical combination, a bulk of 44 is compressed into a bulk of 24. Yet that great compression is consistent with perfect transparency, crystallized salt being perfectly transparent to light, and more so as regards radiant heat than any other substance. Thus chemical affinity does what no mechanical power could accomplish. At an ordinary temperature and barometric pressure, Bromine is an orange-red, extremely volatile fluid, which congeals and becomes brittle at a temperature a little below the zero of Fahrenheit's thermometer, and if combined with water at that degree of cold, it crystallizes in octahedral crystals, which are permanent, even at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Bromine is very poisonous corrodes the skin, has a disagreeable taste, and a smell similar to that of chlorine, but more pungent and hurtful. It possesses a powerful bleaching property, does not conduct electricity, and like chlorine, a taper will not burn in its gas, though it spontaneously sets fire to phosphorus and some of the metals. Reasoning from analogy, Professor Schoenbein believes that chlorine and bromine are not simple substances. He considers them to be ozonides, analogous to the peroxides of manganese, lead, etc. He believes chlorine to be the peroxide of murium and bromine to be the peroxide of bromium. Professor Tyndall's experiments on the absorption and radiation of gases show that the action of these two substances is very different from that of the simple gases. 
Iodine is a dark purple solid, crystallized in scales or elongated octahedral plates. It slowly evaporates at ordinary temperatures, and at that of 350 degrees Fahrenheit, it is volatilized into a beautiful violet-colored gas, which changes starch into a bright blue, and for that reason, a little starch will detect the millionth of a grain of iodine in composition. Iodine is slightly soluble in water, has a hot, acrid taste, and although used in medicine, it is poisonous when taken in large doses. Its bleaching properties are inferior to those of its congeners, but its chemical combinations are the same. With hydrogen, it forms a highly explosive compound, which detonates with the slightest pressure. These three simple substances are analogous in almost every respect. They all possess a bleaching property. Many of their compounds are exceedingly explosive. Combustible substances do not burn in their gases, while their gases set fire spontaneously to substances generally reckoned incombustible. Hence, though not combustible, they support combustion, but in a very different manner from oxygen. Chlorine and the gases of bromine and iodine, diluted with common air, do not transmit blue and violet light. That is to say, the spectrum of a sunbeam transmitted through them is deprived of its most refrangible colored rays, and that which remains is crossed by more than a hundred equidistant dark lines. Their spectral properties, however, will be given hereafter. They resemble oxygen in one respect, that when a current of electricity is passed continuously through a glass tube filled with any of these three gases, much attenuated, they slowly combine with the platinum wire of the negative pole of the battery inserted in the tube. The electricity by degrees passes in diminished quantity and at last ceases altogether showing that matter, however attenuated, is requisite to conduct it. According to the experiments of Monsieur Dumas, the volatility of a compound is in the inverse ratio of the condensation of the substances composing it, and simple bodies come under the same law. For example, Chlorine is more volatile than bromine, and bromine is more volatile than iodine. Hence, according to that law, chlorine is the least dense of the three, bromine is intermediate, and iodine is the most dense. Which is actually the case, for chlorine is a gas, bromine a liquid, and iodine a solid at ordinary temperatures, which proves that there is a sequence in the intensity of the cohesive forces in this triad. Section 2. On Force and the Relations Between Force and Matter Force is only known to us as a manifestation of divine power which can neither be created nor destroyed. The store of force or energy in nature is ever changing its form of action, its amount never. It may be dispersed in various directions and subdivided so as to become evanescent to our perceptions. It may be balanced so as to be in abeyance or it may become potential as in static electricity. But the instant the impediment is removed, the power is manifested by motion. 
Whatever form force may assume, it has invariably a compensation or equivalent, whether in the heavens or on the earth. The total sum of the living forces, viz. viva, or actual energy of the planets, is the same every time they return to the same relative positions with regard to one another, to their orbits and to space, whatever may have been their velocities or mutual disturbances. In the ocean, the energy by which 25,000 cubic miles of water flow over a quarter of the globe in six hours is exactly equal to the force or energy that makes it ebb during the succeeding six hours. A body acquires heat in the exact proportion that the adjacent substances become cold, and when heat is absorbed by a body, it becomes an expansive energy at the expense of those around it which contract. Chemical action many miles distant from the electromagnet, as in telegraphs, is perfectly equivalent to the dominant chemical action in the battery. The two electricities, positive and negative, are developed in equal proportions, which may be combined so as to produce many changes in their respective relations. Yet the sum of the energy of the one kind can never be made in the smallest degree, either to exceed or to come short of the sum of the other. The mechanical energy of machinery or working power is exhausted by the very act of working and cannot be restored except by the action of other forces. In clockwork, the weight must sink to move the wheel, and when the weight is down, the store of energy is gone and can only be restored by raising the weight through the expenditure of energy in the human arm, and the expenditure of human energy must be restored by food and rest. The heat given off from the bodies of men and animals is restored by the combustion of the oxygen inhaled during respiration and the carbon of the food, and the light and heat given out by the combustion of fuel, whether in the form of coal or wood, is compensated by the light and heat of the sun stored up in living vegetables. It is this equivalent for force or energy, which prevails in every department of nature, that constitutes the universal and invariable law of the conservation of energy, a principle in physics as large and sure as that of the indestructibility of matter or the invariability of gravity. No hypothesis should be admitted, nor any assertion of a fact credited, that denies this principle. No view should be inconsistent or incompatible with it. Many of our hypotheses in the present state of science may not comprehend it, and may be unable to suggest its consequences, but none should oppose or contradict it. Thus there is a definite store of energy in the universe, and every natural change or technical work is produced by a part only of this store the store itself being eternal and unchangeable. Cohesion is a force which, acting at inappreciably small distances, unites atoms and molecules of the same kind into solids, liquids, and aeriform fluids, exactly according to the law of the conservation of energy for it requires the very same amount of force to dissolve their union as to form it. Cohesion varies with temperature, both in simple and compound bodies, for metals can be fused and vaporized by artificial heat, and ice becomes water and aqueous vapor 
as the seasons change from winter to summer. In solids, the force of cohesion is so strong that their atoms and molecules always retain their respective places. That power is so weak in liquids that their atoms and molecules are capable of motion among themselves. And in gases and the ethereal medium, the atoms are free and have no cohesion whatever. The resistance offered by substances to compression is an equal and contrary force. The reciprocal attraction between solids and liquids in capillary tubes is a case of cohesion. If a glass tube of extremely fine bore be plunged into a glass of water or alcohol, the liquid will immediately rise in the tube above the level of that in the cup, and the surface of the little suspended column will be a hollow hemisphere. If, on the contrary, mercury be the liquid, it will not rise so high in the glass tube, and the surface of the little column will be a convex hemisphere. There is a reciprocal attraction between the glass tube and the liquid, and another between the particles of the liquid itself, and the effect is produced by the difference between the two. In the first case, the attraction of the glass is greater than that of the liquid, and in the second, it is less. Hence, the water rises higher in the tube than the mercury, and its surface is concave, while that of the mercury is convex. The elevation or depression of the same liquid in different tubes of the same matter is in the inverse ratio of their internal diameters, and altogether independent of their thickness. Whence it follows that molecular action is insensible at sensible distances, for when tubes of the same bore are wetted throughout their whole extent with water, mercury will rise to the same height in all of them, whatever be their thickness or density. The film of water being sufficient to intercept the molecular action and to supply the place of a tube by its own capillary action. The action of this force is daily seen in the absorption of water by sponges, sugar, salt, and other porous bodies, and it is a most important agent in the circulation of fluids in animals and vegetables. Every atom of matter is subject to the force of gravitation, but each substance has its own peculiar weight of specific gravity. That is to say, the same bulk of different substances contains different quantities of matter. Since nothing is known of absolute weight, it is necessary to have some standard of comparison, and for that purpose, pure water at the temperature of 39 degrees Fahrenheit that of its maximum density, is chosen for solids and liquids. While for gases and vapors, atmospheric air at the temperature of 60 degrees of Fahrenheit's thermometer and a barometric pressure of 30 inches is assumed as the unit of specific gravity. The foot-pound which is the unit of mechanical force as established by Mr. Joule, is the force that would raise one pound of matter to the height of one foot, or it is the impetus of force generated by a body of one pound weight, falling by its gravitation through the height of one foot. Now impetus, or vis viva, is equal to the mass of a body multiplied by the square of the velocity with which it is moving. It is the true measure of work or mechanical labor. For if a weight be raised ten feet, it will require four times the labor to raise an equal weight to forty feet. If both these weights be allowed to fall freely by their gravitation, 
At the end of their descent, their velocities will be as one to two, that is, as the square roots of their heights. But the effect produced will be as their masses multiplied by one and four, but these are the squares of their velocities. Hence, impetus or vis viva is equal to the mass multiplied by the square of the velocity. Thus, impetus is the true measure of the labor employed to raise the weights and of the effect of their descent and is entirely independent of time. It is well known that iron becomes red hot by percussion or impetus. The atoms of the iron are thrown into vibration, and these minute motions communicated to the nerves produce the sensation of heat. Now the mechanical labor required to raise the hammer to any number of feet is equal to the weight of the hammer multiplied by that number of feet. But the impetus or mechanical effect of the fall of the hammer is equal to its mass multiplied by the square of the velocity, that is, to the vis viva. Hence the quantity of heat generated is proportional to the vis viva. The circumstances being the same, if the mass be doubled, the amount of heat is doubled. And if the velocity be doubled, the amount of heat is quadrupled. If the weight and the perpendicular height through which a body has fallen be known, the quantity of heat generated may be determined. The same amount of heat is generated by the same amount of force, whatever that force may be, whether impetus, friction, or any other. Dr. Thompson has put in a strong point of view the quantity of heat that might be generated by percussion or impetus. He computed that if, by any sudden shock, the Earth were arrested in its orbit, the heat generated by the impulse would be equal to 11,200 degrees of the centigrade thermometer, even if the capacity of our planet for heat were as low as that of water. It would therefore be mostly reduced to vapor. And should the earth then fall to the sun, as it certainly would do, the quantity of heat developed by striking on the sun would be 400 times greater. It is even supposed that the light and heat of the sun are owing to showers of bodies falling on the surface, with impetus proportionate to his attraction, for had he been in combustion, he would have burnt out ages ago. The masses of meteoric iron and stone that occasionally fall on the earth show that matter may be wandering in space. The vast zone of smaller bodies that in their annual revolutions round the sun come within the Earth's attraction in August and November when thousands of them take fire and are consumed on entering our atmosphere show that a great amount of matter of small dimensions exists within our own system. Much may be beyond it, which drawn by the sun's attraction may fall on his surface. When a body is heated, it absorbs one part of the heat, the other part raises its temperature. The part absorbed increases the bulk or volume of the body, the expansion being the exact measure or mechanical equivalent of the heat absorbed. In fact, the coefficient of expansion is the fractional part of the expansion of length, surface, or volume of the body when its temperature is raised one degree. When the body is cooled, its volume is diminished, and then the contraction is an exact measure.
or mechanical equivalent of the heat given out, and thus expansion and contraction are correlatives with and represent heat and cold. Specific heat is the quantity of heat required to raise a given bulk or a given weight of a body a given number of degrees. In the one case, it is distinguished as the specific heat for a constant volume, in the other, for a constant weight. Although the specific heat of a substance remains the same, its sensible and absorbed heat may vary reciprocally to a great extent. As there can be no direct measurement of heat independent of matter, its mutations and action on matter are the sole means we have of forming our judgment concerning its agency in the material world. Mr. Jewell has proved that the quantity of heat requisite to raise the temperature of a pound of water one degree of the centigrade thermometer is equivalent to the mechanical work or force that would raise the same mass of water to the height of 1,389 feet. This is the unit or mechanical equivalent of heat. In fact, for every unit of force expended in percussion, friction, or raising a weight, a definite quantity of heat is generated, and conversely, when work is performed by the consumption of heat, for each unit of force gained, a unit of heat disappears. For since heat is a dynamical force of mechanical effect, there must be an equivalence between mechanical work and heat, as between cause and effect. That equivalence is a law of nature. The mechanical force exerted by the steam engine is exactly in proportion to the consumption of heat, neither more nor less. For if we could produce a greater quantity than its equivalent, we should have perpetual motion, which is impossible. When steam is employed to perform any work, the temperature of the steam is lowered. The heat that disappears is transformed into the force that performs the work, and is exactly proportional to the work done, and vice versa. The heat which is the motive force in the steam engine is due to the chemical combination of the carbon of the fuel with the oxygen of the atmosphere. A pound weight of coal when consumed in one of our best steam engines produces an effect equal to raising a weight of a million of pounds a foot high. Yet marvelous as that is, the investigations of recent years have demonstrated the fact that the mechanical energy resident in a pound of coal and liberated by its combustion, is capable of raising to the same height ten times that weight. The quantity of coal existing in the whole globe is believed to be inexhaustible, hence the energy in abeyance is incalculable. The chemical energy continually and actually exerted in the great laboratory of nature is greater than that which maintains the planets in their orbits. The act of the combination of the atoms of carbon and oxygen in combustion is now regarded exactly as we regard the clashing of a falling weight against the earth, and the heat produced in both cases is referable to the same cause. So chemical combination in combustion is only a particular case of falling bodies. Drummond's light, the most brilliant of artificial illuminations, is produced by a simultaneous shower of the atoms of oxygen and hydrogen gas upon lime, and platinum, 
the least fusible of metals, is vaporized by a similar shower from the oxyhydrogen blowpipe, and thus impetus generates both light and heat. For although the atoms are too small to admit of an estimation of their individual vis viva, there can be no doubt that like causes produce like effects. In what manner or under what form magnetism and electricity exist when quiescent in matter, we know not. But the compass needles show that numerous lines of magnetic force, subject to periodic and secular variations, perpetually traverse the earth and the ocean, and that waves of magnetic force occasionally sweep rapidly over great tracts of the globe. These phenomena would seem to stand in some periodic connection with the solar spots. Professor Lamont of Munich has discovered that a permanent and regular current of electricity is propagated parallel to the equator all over the Earth, and another similar to it in the atmosphere. Besides these, there are currents of electricity in the surface of the Earth, sometimes in one direction and sometimes in another, which decrease with the depth. And Mr. Lamont conceives that this electric system is the cause of terrestrial magnetism. Electricity of intense power and inappreciable quantity certainly exists in abeyance in the atmosphere and in all terrestrial matter till the equilibrium between the antagonist forces be disturbed. And then it bursts forth with terrific violence in the lightning flash and stunning crash of thunder. Since it requires electricity equivalent to that in activity during a thunderstorm, to form one drop of water, what must that power have been which the Omnipotent wielded when he created that deep over the face of which darkness brooded? Electricity, though the most formidable power in nature, is made available to man by the voltaic battery and by the electromagnetic induction apparatus in the battery of which it is generated by the chemical action of dilute sulfuric acid on zinc. The positive and negative electricities thus produced pass in opposite directions through the two conducting wires of the machine by a continuous transmission of force or vibration from atom to atom, a circulation that is accompanied by a continual development of heat in overcoming the resistance it meets with in the wires. The electricity decreases as the heat increases and vice versa. The action is reciprocal. Thus, electricity is merely a transmission of force. Mr. Joule has proved that the quantity of heat produced in a unit of time is proportional to the strength of the current, whatever may be its direction, and that its power to overcome resistance is as the square of the force of the current. The force is exactly in proportion to the chemical action which produces it, and that is measured by the quantity of zinc consumed in the battery. Thus, chemical action produces electricity, and conversely, electricity is a powerful agent in the chemical composition and decomposition of matter. The light and heat of the electric spark are intense, though instantaneous. But a powerful induction apparatus like Rumkorff's gives so rapid a succession of sparks that the light and heat are sensibly continuous and of great intensity. The light and heat, 
powerful as lightning itself, are produced by the combined currents of two batteries, each consisting of 50 Bunsen elements of moderate size. This formidable united current passes through a circuit of thick copper wire coated with silk thread with an intensity of perpetually renewed heat that no substance can resist. When the copper conducting wires are fitted with charcoal terminals and brought near to one another, the dazzling lights emanating from each pole combine in one blaze of insupportable brilliancy. The most refractory substances, silica, alumina, iron, and platinum, when placed between the poles, immediately melt like wax and volatilize. Charcoal is so good a conductor of electricity that when the terminals are in contact, they complete the circuit, and neither light nor heat appear. Air and glass are non-conductors, yet the spark has passed through several inches of air and perforated a mass of glass two inches thick. A long electric spark combines or decomposes a greater quantity of gas or vapor than a short one, and for a given induction apparatus and induction current, Mr. Perrault has shown that there exists a length of spark corresponding to a maximum chemical action. Professor Siebeck of Berlin discovered that electric currents are produced by the partial application of heat to a circuit formed of two solid conducting substances as antimony and bismuth soldered together. Another proof of the correlation of heat and electricity. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from On Molecular and Microscopic Science by Mary Somerville. I confess that was a lot more physics than I was expecting, but I suppose it's all part of one grand system. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.